Good evening, everyone, and welcome. This evening, before we begin our worship together, we have one announcement. This Wednesday evening, we hope to have a time of family worship uh, together, songs, devotions, and prayer together at 7 o'clock this Wednesday. And what we'll do is send you all an email link to a Zoom account. So if you haven't used Zoom before, uh, it'll take a little bit of time to download that onto your computer. Um, and then we'll all be able to log in together and have that time of, of family worship, 7 o'clock this Wednesday. With that, let's stand together as God calls us to worship Him uh, with these words from Psalm 98. From Psalm 98, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for He has done marvelous things. His right hand and His holy arm have worked salvation for Him. The Lord has made known His salvation. He has revealed His righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered His steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, You have given us minds to know You and hearts to love You and voices to sing Your praise. As we worship You this evening, please fill us with Your Spirit so that we can celebrate your glory and worship you in spirit and in truth, and with reverence and awe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14 gives us this assurance and promise. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let's continue worshiping together as we turn in our Trinity Psalter hymnals to number 429. 429, come thou fount of every blessing. I now invite you to turn to the back of your Trinity Psalter hymnals to page 851. Page 851, as we profess our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We now turn together to number 433, 433, Amazing Grace, and we'll sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 6 of Amazing Grace. This evening, I invite you to take your Bibles with me and open them to Psalm 63. Psalm 63. This is a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Beginning with verse 1, O God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword, and they shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult from the mouths of liars will be stopped. Throughout this psalm, the Holy Spirit teaches us to search for our God all the more earnestly when we find ourselves in the wildernesses of life. We can believe that His power and glory and love and even help are there even when we can't see evidences of them. Our soul can cling to Him even when we see no evidence that His strong right hand is there holding us securely. For though at times there may be no evidence in our experience, there is always evidence in the experience of Jesus Christ. 
It was not during his temptation in the desert that he experienced the the depths of the wilderness that we see expressed here in Psalm 63. It was on the cross. For on the cross, Jesus experienced isolation, desolation, beyond human comprehension or understanding that we might know the indescribable satisfaction that awaits us at the end of our search for God's presence. And that's what David is longing for, the presence of the Lord. Oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. And because of Christ, we can know that at the end of our search for God's presence, we find him in our lives, his power, his glory, his love, and his help. We're going to sing Psalm 63 together. I invite you to take your Trinity Psalter hymnals and open them with me to Psalm 63b. Psalm 63b, O Lord, my God, most earnestly. At this time, let's join our hearts together in our pastoral prayer. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we realize and we confess before you that if you kept a record of sins, oh Lord, who could stand? If you should take into account what we have done, we would be unworthy to lift our eyes towards heaven and present our prayers before you. Our consciences accuse us and our sins testify against us. And yet, in your fatherly goodness, you have adopted us in Christ and delight to hear our prayers, which we offer through him, our Savior and our Mediator. We don't look to any other king and seek no other advice or advocate for the help that we need in this world and in the world to come is found in Christ alone. You call us to seek not only our own salvation and good, but that of your whole church and the world. And so we do so now. We pray especially that your blessing will be on your holy gospel, that it may faithfully be proclaimed, and that the world may be filled with the knowledge of your truth. And to that end, Lord, we pray that you will send workers into your field to plant and water and harvest a people for your name. The harvest is ready, O Lord, but the workers are few. And so please send out workers into your harvest fields. Please frustrate the work of those who would sow weeds of heresy and discord. Lord, please pull down the strongholds of Satan in this world. 
and establish your kingdom throughout the earth. Give your attention to your servants who are suffering persecution because of the gospel. Strengthen them in mind and body by your spirit through the means of grace. Lord, this evening in a special way, we pray for uh, the church in Central and South America. We pray for her continued growth and the vitality of the churches there. We pray that the gospel in this region will remain pure and not mixed with the false gospel of, of prosperity. Pray, Lord, that we pray that you would keep this church and sustain this church in these countries that are modernizing and secularizing. And then we pray that you would preserve your saints in these many countries that feel the effects of civil war and poverty and natural disaster. Lord, we ask that the beauty of true worship would be experienced by all our brothers and sisters in South and Central America. Lord, we pray for the growth of Reformed communities through the URCNA missions work that's going on in Costa Rica and Ecuador, Honduras, and Mexico. Lord, continue to bless the work that's taking place in these locations. Lord, we also lift up in prayer Reverend Andrew Spiernsma as he continues his work as a chaplain in the U.S. Army. Give him wisdom as he finishes up his studies in counseling. And we also pray that you will fill him with the power of the Holy Spirit in the counseling room as he talks and prays with soldiers and their families at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Lord, we lift up in prayer those who serve our common good each day. We pray that you will bless them, those you have uh, ordained to govern us. Give them wisdom and integrity. Give them a restraining fear of you and keep them from abusing their power. Give them the knowledge that they need uh, as they make difficult decisions during this time. We ask that you will please use them to contribute to the advancement of society in a way that is pleasing to you. May they restrain wickedness and sin and promote justice and virtue. Let them remove every obstacle to the preaching of the gospel and worship so that your word may go out with power. The kingdom of Christ may progress and every anti-Christian power may be restrained and resisted. Lord, you are the one who sends rain upon the just and the unjust alike. And so we ask that you will give us such humility of conduct and faithfulness in our callings that we may contribute to the good of our neighbors and live lives of peace in all godliness and honor. Lord, we also remember this evening those who suffer from physical dangers, temptation or doubts, illness of mind or body, or even financial stress. Lord, we pray especially for those who are facing death. We ask for your comfort for all widows and widowers and orphans. May they know your fatherly goodness. Show your mercy, O Lord, to prisoners, to those in the military and those who need to travel for business. Guard their families and bring them back home safely, we ask. And may the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, your Son, refresh your people in their trials and give them the grace to bear the difficulties you send them for their good. Give also to us the grace to share in their suffering and provide for their needs as we are able. Lord, we ask that you would deepen the bonds and relationships between us as spouses and as parents and children. Please resolve conflict and strife according to your wisdom and grace. To those among us who are single, we ask that you'll give the gifts for building up the community of the saints, as well as faithfulness in the face of temptation, and grant that your people may build them up in the most holy faith. Lord, please strengthen us through your means of grace, that we may worship you not only with our words, but also with our lives. Build us up into one body, a city in the world whose light cannot be hidden. 
Make each of us, we pray, a living sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, pleasing to you. For this is our reasonable service in view of the sacrifice which alone has made us right with you. Lord, we bring before your throne these prayer requests and praises, lifting up each other in prayer in Jesus' name. Lord, hear our prayer as we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, as we get ready to turn our attention to God's Word, I invite you to take your Trinity Psalter hymnal and open it with me to Psalm 119R. Psalm 119R, O Lord, you are the righteous one. We'll sing verses 1 and 4 of Psalm 119R. This evening we'll be looking at Lord's Day 4 together in the Heidelberg Catechism. And for those of you who have a Trinity Psalter hymnal at home, you can open it to page 873. Page 873, Lord's Day 4. And for those of you with the Forms and Prayers book, uh, you can find Lord's Day 4 on page 204. The Lord's Day 4, I'll read each of these questions and we can respond together with each of the answers. First question, answer 9. But doesn't God do man on injustice by requiring in his law what man is unable to do? No, God created man with the ability to keep the law. Man, however, at the instigation of the devil in willful disobedience, robbed himself and all his descendants of these gifts. Will God permit such disobedience and rebellion to go unpunished? Certainly not. He is terribly angry with the sin we are born with, as well as our actual sins. God will punish them by a just judgment, both now and in eternity, having declared Cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the things written in the book of the law. But isn't God also merciful? God is certainly merciful, but he is also just. His justice demands that sin committed against his supreme majesty be punished with the supreme penalty, eternal punishment of body and soul. I now invite you to open up your Bibles with me. We'll be looking at Romans 3. And once you've found Romans 3, verses 21 through 26, and you can turn a few pages to Romans 9, verse 14. Romans 3. And Romans chapter 9, before we turn our attention to God's word, let's ask him for his blessing. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, as we turn to your word, we ask that you will give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know you better. We pray also that the eyes of our hearts may be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which you have called us the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints and your incomparably great power 
for us who believe. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 3, beginning with verse 21. Let's pay careful attention because this is God speaking his word to us. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is ours in that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And now turning over to Romans chapter 9, beginning with verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Even us, whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not my beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very same place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. The grass withers and the flowers fall. The word of our Lord remains forever. People of God, when we think about the Reformation, we often think about Martin Luther nailing the 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Chapel over 500 years ago. And we often think about what happened after the, Refor- the, the Reformation that resulted from that nailing of the 95 Theses. But what we often overlook is the spiritual crisis that Luther went through that led up to that point. And that crisis that Luther endured was a struggle with God's perfect justice. Luther was studying to be a lawyer, and on his daily walk, he would 
pass a, a sculpture that captured his, his spiritual struggle. It was a, a statue of, of Jesus as judge with, with a sword clenched in his teeth and a piercing stare. And that image would haunt Luther for years as he struggled with his guilt before God. Luther became a monk, still struggling with that guilt, still wrestling with his guilt before a just God, doing everything that he could to resolve this spiritual crisis. He felt that like he was abandoned by God because he wasn't good enough. Luther, later in life, when he reflected back on his days of, of being a monk, he said, I myself was a monk for 20 years. I tortured myself with praying and fasting and keeping vigils and freezing. The cold alone was enough to kill me. And I inflicted upon myself such pain as I would never inflict again, even if I could. In fact, Luther carried out his duties as a monk so completely that he explained, if any monk ever got into heaven by monkery, I should have made it. All my monastery companions who knew me can testify to that. If it had lasted much longer, I would have killed myself with vigils and praying and reading and other labors and works. There was still no resolution for this spiritual crisis that Luther was going through. For the judgment that he felt, the guilt that he carried, with no grace and no mercy in sight. Another monk in Wittenberg couldn't understand why Luther couldn't comprehend God's love for him. Love God, Luther responded. I can't love God. I hate him. For Luther at this time, God was completely unfair. God was completely unjust. He was making demands, perfect demands, according to his law that could not possibly be met. It's as if God laid down the perfect law and left us floundering and failing. And Luther was facing this spiritual crisis as he was confronted with God's perfect standard, his perfect justice, and came to realize that there was nothing that he could do, no matter how hard he tried, to earn the righteousness that he needed in order to get into heaven. Now, as we've been working our way through the, the catechism up to this point, we've been talking about our sins and how God's law makes us aware of our sinful situation. It reveals our sin. God's law is the, the flashlight that shines into the dark corners of our hearts, revealing our sin. And last time we covered that, uh, where our sin and misery comes from. It, it comes from the fall, that first fall of our parents, Adam and Eve. And now this evening, as we pick up the catechism once again, we're focused on God's response to sin, on God's perfect justice. Now, God is just, and we can trust Him and love Him, even when, from our perspective, things seem unfair. And the reason that we can love Him, the reason that we can trust Him, is because of the justice and righteousness that is ours in Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to see this evening uh, when we look at our three points. Our three points are the, the three questions that we, we asked from Lord's Day 4. First, we'll be looking at and answering, is God unfair? Secondly, does sin go unpunished? And then third and finally, but what about mercy? And so first, is God unfair? Is God unfair? Have you ever felt like this? Maybe you're going through a spiritual crisis like Luther. Felt like God was expecting more from you than you could possibly give. Like you've been stretched to the breaking point only to be confronted by yet another crisis. In Romans 9 verse 14, Paul asks the question, well, what should we say then? 
Is there injustice on God's part? Is God unjust? Is God unfair? And he answers immediately by saying, by no means. Now, he's asking this question and and responding to his rhetorical question by In light of what he had just said earlier in chapter 9, if you have your Bibles open, you can see that there Paul is is describing God showing mercy to some and and hardening the hearts of, of others. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And then we get to verse 18, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. And so the logic at that point, if this is the case that God shows mercy to some and he hardens the hearts of others, then the question is, well, how can we be held responsible? God is the one who hardened the hearts of some and God's the one who showed mercy to others. How can God blame us for a hard heart if part of his will is that we have a hard heart? Or how can he blame us if he's shown us mercy? For who can resist his will, as the argument goes here in Romans uh, chapter 9? How can God blame us for the situation we find ourselves in if he's the one who put us in that situation? Verse 19, why does God still find fault? For who can resist his will? Paul has made it clear That God does what he wills when it comes to saving people by his mercy. And he hardens others' hearts. And so the question that is coming forward that Paul is anticipating is, is why or or how uh, can God blame us for that? The catechism also brings up this question from our human perspective. When it comes to the justice of God, isn't it unfair that God would ask us to do what we're unable to do? It's a similar question that's being asked in our passage. How can God blame us? It's not my fault, so to speak. Now, we just finished learning that we are so corrupt because of sin that we are not able to do anything good according to God's standard. That there is nothing in our ability that is pleasing to God in and of ourselves. And from that perspective, God seems unfair to then demand perfection, to demand perfect obedience which there is no way that we can achieve. And that's where the question comes from. But doesn't God do us an injustice by requiring in his law what we are unable to do? In our way of thinking, from our perspective, this seems unfair. This doesn't seem right. But look how question and answer nine answers. Is God unfair? Does he do man an injustice by requiring in his law what we're not able to do? And the answer is no. God created man with the ability to keep the law. Man, however, not God, man, at the instigation of the devil, in willful disobedience, robbed himself and all his descendants of these gifts. So what we're keeping in mind here is that you have God, who is the Lord of history, if mercy and hardening alike proclaim his name throughout the earth, if he shows mercy to whomever he wants and he hardens the hearts of whomever he wants, then how can God blame us for what we do? Or how can God blame them for what they do? It's all happening according to God's plan, his will, his deliberate purposes. So often... When we look at salvation, God's justice, him him giving mercy and him hardening according to his will, we tend to focus on the fact that not everyone is going to heaven. We focus on those whom he's hardened, that there are individuals whose hearts are hard toward the Lord. And the question that comes to our mind, even if we don't say it out loud, is, well, how could God do that? 
How could God, if it's up to him, harden some hearts? And what we mean is how could God not save anyone? How could he harden hearts? How could he intentionally do that and not save everyone or show mercy to everyone? We don't seem to have much of a choice in the matter, so how could he hold us accountable and and punish us in that way? How could he harden hearts? How could he not save everyone? This isn't fair. Now, Paul in our passage this evening is approaching this topic from a different perspective. Paul is talking about how there are now Gentiles in the church. It's not just Jews anymore. But God, according to his will, according to his mercy, has brought Gentiles of all people in to be part of his children. So for Paul, the surprising thing is not that isn't that there are people whose hearts are hardened by the Lord, but rather that there are Gentiles, non-Jews, who are now being shown mercy. That's the shocking thing here. And we see that expressed in verse 9. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. That's chapter 9, verse 6. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. So what Paul is saying here is that not all of the biological descendants of Abraham, a.k.a. all of the Jews, are actually of Abraham. The surprising thing here is that God has shown mercy to those who are not biologically related to Abraham, but are yet considered children of Abraham. The Jews at this time were inclined to think that God couldn't do anything but show them mercy because they were his people. And that God couldn't do anything but harden the hearts of Gentiles because they weren't. And Paul is rejecting that and pointing out that God does whatever he wants. What God wills is what he does. And the question for Paul isn't, how could he harden hearts? Why isn't everyone saved? That doesn't seem fair. The question that Paul is asking is how could he show mercy and save anyone? How is that fair? Do you see the difference how from our perspective we wonder why God didn't save everyone as if he owed us? And Paul is answering this question or asking this question of how could God show mercy to anyone when we didn't deserve it at all? It's like question and answer nine mentions. He created us good and in his image with the ability to keep his law, the ability to keep his perfect standards. And we are the ones who gave in to the temptation of Satan. We are the ones who chose to disobey. We are the ones who chose death. We aren't victims here of a a ruthless dictator and his frivolous decisions. We are facing the perfect justice for the sins that we are guilty of. It is just. It is fair for everyone to receive punishment for their sins. What would be unfair is if God didn't punish sins. So when we ask the question, is God unfair? The answer is no, not at all. He is completely just, completely fair, and righteous. And that brings us to our second question. Does does sin go unpunished? That's question and answer 10. Will God permit such disobedience and rebellion to go unpunished? And the answer is certainly not. 
He is terribly angry with the sin we are born with, as well as our actual sins. Notice the difference between the sin we are born with, original sin, and actual sin, the sins we actually do. God will punish them by a just judgment both now and in eternity, having declared, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the things written in the book of the law. So does sin go unpunished? And the answer is no. As a just judge, God punishes sin now, punishes sins now and in eternity. His justice demands that sin committed against his supreme majesty be punished with the supreme penalty, eternal punishment of body and soul. Justice must prevail. And at this point, we could ask, well, what is justice? Maybe that term or the definition is a little bit foggy for us. What is justice? And the simple answer is God. God is justice. God is the definition of justice. In English, the terms uh, justice and righteousness are obviously two different words for us, justice and righteousness. But in both the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament, there is just one word for justice and righteousness. And these two words or characteristics are one in the same when it comes to us talking about God. God's righteousness means that God always acts in accordance with what is right, and He Himself is what is right and just. And this is part of God's holiness, which is God's perfection, purity, and hatred for sin. And so when it comes to what is right and wrong, the ultimate standard for right and wrong is God. He is what is just and fair. And whenever Scripture confronts the question of whether God himself is righteous or not, or, or just or not, the ultimate answer is always that we as God's creatures have no right to say that God is unjust or that he is unfair. The creature cannot say that about the creator. And that's how Paul responds to this very, very difficult question. He responds to this question about God's righteousness and justice by basically saying, you're asking the wrong question. Questions that creatures have no right to ask of their creator. It's an illegitimate question. Who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God, to answer back to God? Will what is molded or formed say to its molder, why have you made me like this? And at first, it might be a little bit frustrating for us not to have an answer here. And it's not the, that there is no answer to the question, but what Paul is pointing out is that we are out of line when we ask this kind of question of God. We are not in a position to talk back to God like this. And that there's a contrast between a lowly and ignorant man on the one side against the great God whose purposes run throughout the all of uh, all of history and, and who upholds all of creation, both past, present, and future, upholding all things according to his will. And Paul explains this reality by pointing to the potter. And he's saying, can, can the pot that he made ask him, why did you make me like this? Can't the artist form from the same lump of clay Something used, something beautiful, used for noble use, and, and something that's not. And the answer to his rhetoric is, oh, yes, obviously. The clay is not going to talk back to the potter. The piece of pottery is not in a superior position to the artist that is forming it. It's not allowed to say, why did you make me like this? What were you thinking? And so in a similar way, who are you? To talk back to God who created you. Why did you make me like this? And the point is that God as the creator is always going to do things that we as creatures don't understand. 
when you look over at verse 22, what if God desiring to show his wrath and to make it known his power has endured with patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? What if right now we feel like God is being unfair because the wicked over there, they're doing just fine. Life is actually really good for them. And it seems unfair from our limited perspective, that the wicked are prospering and the righteous are suffering. And Paul's pointing to the bigger picture saying, what if God decided to show them patience at this point, desiring to show his wrath and make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy? So in that moment, who are we to say, God, what are you doing? What are you thinking? God is just. He is righteous. And putting ourselves in his position, calling him to account as if we were the judge, doesn't accomplish anything. As sinners, we are out of our league if we think that we can talk back to God and tell him what is just and fair and righteous because we are talking to the very definition of what is just and fair and righteous. And as we consider God's justice here and how he deals with sin, those with hardened hearts, what Paul is saying here is that God created people and people became sinners and that God then dealt with them as sinners. Murray explains it like this. Paul is not now dealing with God's sovereign rights over men as men, but over men as sinners. There is always punishment for sin. Justice is served. God never looks the other way. He never brushes our sin under the rug. He deals with it as the just and righteous judge that he is. Recently, we looked at Romans 3 and pointed to the fact that there is no one righteous. No, not one. But then it goes on to point to the righteousness, the justification that is ours in Christ. Remember that righteousness, justice, justified, it's all the same word in, in the Greek. And that's why different translations will translate. He did this to demonstrate his justice. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. It's one and the same. In sending his one and only son, Jesus Christ, as the atoning sacrifice, as the propitiation, for sin, God was expressing his perfect justice. Sin must be punished. Justice, righteousness, holiness demands it. And now Christ is the one taking that punishment that we deserve onto himself because of God's perfect justice. But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. It's perfect justice. Christ pays the price, dies in our place. And it doesn't end there because in addition to our sins being paid for and the wrath of God being satisfied we also are declared to be the very opposite of what we actually are. And that is perfectly righteous and justified before God. A righteousness from God, which is ours through faith in Jesus Christ. And that, people of God, is the good news of the gospel. The reason for the Reformation. And it brings us to our, our third and our final point this evening. But what about mercy? As Luther studied Paul, 
he began to realize that our sin was more than just the sins that we commit. Remember, I made the distinction between original sin and actual sin. Well, here, Luther's realizing that sin is more than just our actual sins, the sins that we commit, but also the root of our nature, our original sin, that inheritance that nobody wants from Adam, but everybody gets. And because of that, forgiveness and redemption has to be more than just taking taking care of individual sins, the individual sins that we do. Redemption needs to take care of our very nature as sinners. We are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. It's part of who we are. And Luther is, is realizing this. And it's a new uh, realization for him. Because at the time, at that time in the Middle Ages, the medieval church, sin was a, a very superficial thing. You could deal with it through uh, confessionals and doing penance for each individual sins. Doing penance was the way that you made yourself right with God. Uh, say a few prayers, give a few more dollars, go through the proper motions. But Luther began to realize that the penance, the prayers, the fasting, uh, the, the vigils, they, they weren't enough. And they would never be enough. Because the righteousness that God's perfect justice requires is not something that we can produce ourselves because by nature we are sinners. And what we need is a righteousness that is outside of ourselves. A righteousness that comes from someone else. And that is the righteousness of Jesus Christ a righteousness that we hold on to by faith alone. And now you're beginning to see how and why faith in Christ's righteous, Christ alone, faith alone, became such great foundational blocks of the Reformation. It's what had been missing for so many years. It's not about what I do, but, what about, but about what Christ has done. Luther had gone from seeing his righteousness as active, as something he had to do, something he had to achieve, and he went from that to seeing it as something passive, something Christ has achieved on his behalf. And it's ours not because of what we do, but because of faith alone. And now, like Luther, at times in our own lives, we may wonder what we need to do in order for God to love us. Notice the subtle shift there. God's love being dependent on, on what we do or do not do. All of a sudden, we've slipped into making his love for us conditional on what we do instead of on what Christ has fully done. Maybe if I pray more, or maybe if I do this more or that more, and these might be really good things. But what we've overlooked and what we always need to remember is that God's unconditional love for us in Christ is not dependent on what we do or don't do because he loves us with the perfect love because of who we are in his son, Jesus. Through faith in Christ, we are declared righteous, not with a righteousness that we have earned, but with a righteousness, the righteousness of Christ that is ours by faith. And that's the gospel that Luther discovered for himself over 500 years ago. And that's the good news that we continue to celebrate and live out to this very day. That scripture alone says that we are righteous, justified before God by his grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. And this is God's perfect justice. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that your word tells us that we are righteous, justified before you 
by your grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for your glory alone. Lord, we thank you for the good news of the gospel, that our sins and your wrath against our sin has been satisfied, has been forgiven, that we are now clothed with the righteousness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, all an expression of your perfect justice. Lord, help us to live each and every day in light of who we are in Christ, the righteousness that is ours in Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Our song of application this evening is number 351 in our Trinity Psalter hymnals. I invite you to take your Trinity Psalter hymnals and open them with me to number 351, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Let's stand and sing this song together. People of God, hear this blessing from Numbers 6, verse 24 and through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>